Good morning and welcome to our Sunday School class. Uh, this is Sunday, December the 27th, 2020. And we are studying from uh, David C. Cook books. Not a Cook book, but David C. Cook's Sunday School book. Okay, so uh, if uh, you're on uh, lesson four, and in my recollection here, it says page 22. Now, if you have a uh, large type book, it'll be page 26. All righty, before we get started there, I'd like to thank everybody for their cards and uh, gifts of love. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we really appreciate those. I trust that you had a uh, positive and a very Merry Christmas, and looking forward to a Happy New Year. Okay, now, one thing I want to bring up before we uh, get to our prayer list here is I'm thinking about the uh, first of the year, and uh, we want to start uh, getting back together a little bit there, but I know a lot of our other churches are uh, having what they call drive-in church, where we would drive our cars into the parking lot behind the church there, and uh, I could have a... Uh, uh, sound system that would actually broadcast over your FM radio in your car. So I think maybe if everybody's up for it, maybe we'll start out that way. Uh, I'm uh, sort of tentatively aiming at the second week of uh, J January, but I do want to know from you if that's uh, feasible for you. Um, if some folks can't get out for that, I'll try to figure out and make sure we can record and still get it on YouTube and have the DVDs that you can't make it out. But if it sounds like a good and a plausible uh, uh, alternative, please let me know. Give me a call. Drop me a line. Uh, email me at jtownsend at atlanticvb.net. And let me know about that if you will. Okay, as soon as possible, please. We uh, just have a couple of weeks to work up to that. Alrighty. Uh, also, uh, let's not forget to uh, send your worship through tithe, uh, and you can mail that to the church, 2930 or 2932 Maple Avenue in uh, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 16601, and I'll get it and make sure it gets out to uh, Allen. Okay. Alrighty. Let's go over to our prayer list. And uh, you should have an updated at this point. It'll be uh, 1220 should be the date on it. And I should get you some new ones out um, probably Sunday. I'll try to run them out to you uh, Saturday possibly. Uh, this is uh, Friday. This is Christmas Day I'm uh, recording this on. So I'll try to get those out to you. But if I don't, we'll use the ones you already have couple of uh, additions there on your cancer list. Uh, Brother Allen gave me the name Gary Phipps, P-H-I-P-P-S, uh, has melanoma cancer. So if you'll add him in, I, I put him on number 39 if you want to follow suit there. And then uh, on the praise note on the back, uh, uh, Pastor and Yvonne have a... Uh, a new great-grandbaby. Uh, that'd be Luke and Katrina's grandbaby, and uh, mom and dad are Blake and uh, Jacob, uh, Willie, and uh, the baby's name is Bailey Willie. Bailey the Willie. So we welcome a new uh, addition to the family and hopefully to the church as they come along. And you uh, may want to pray for them. Jacob is in town for Christmas. Uh, I think he has to get back uh, on his deployment, not deployment, but back uh, on his uh, mil military service there with the Marines uh, pretty close after Christmas. So uh, pray for that, if you will. Okay, the rest of your prayer list ought to be uh, pretty well up to date there at the moment. If you have additions or uh, updates on it, we'd like to keep it updated because we are a praying church and we believe God answers prayer. So, uh, again, you can contact me by telephone, by snail mail, they call it these days, by dropping a letter or a card in the postal service, 
or you can get me at jtownsandatlanticbb.net on the uh, internet. Not on the internet, but email, excuse me. I'll get my words out here in a minute. Okay, let's go to our Sunday school time, and we'll open up with a word of prayer. And uh, Yvonne's here with me today. She's going to help me do some of the reading. So Yvonne, I haven't asked you ahead of time, but would you uh, open in prayer for us? Thank you, Father, for another day, another day to serve you, and another day to rejoice as we celebrate the day set aside to the birth of Jesus. And uh, we thank you for him, and thank you for his dying on the cross for us, and then raising again. Just bless us today as we go to our Sunday school. Amen. Amen. All righty, let me read you the Understanding the Bible out of the teacher's book here, and then we'll get started on Called to Prepare. And uh, the focus of our lesson today is prepare for Jesus to change you. Uh, if you become a born-again child of God, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and no changes occur in your life, uh, you don't have much evidence that God is working there. So uh, let, look for those changes. Listen to the Holy Spirit, and he's going to change you. And that's what our lesson's about today, is you need to be prepared uh, for God to uh, change you. And uh, again, the uh, title is called to prepare. As we saw in the last lesson, the Magi worshipped Jesus as the true king of Israel and brought him gifts worthy of his royal position. Today, we see the preparation for the king's public presentation to his people. It was common among royalty, and still is, for there to be a big fanfare announcing the public entrance. Because Jesus is the true king, it is necessary that there be an appropriate preparation for his public entrance. However, in keeping with the Lord's humble character, as he began his public ministry, instead of a grand, even gaudy affair involving vast multitudes of a large metropolis, we find one man clothed in camel hair preaching in the wilderness of Judea. That's John the Baptist. Nevertheless, because of the one being introduced, John's message made more of an impact for eternity than all the royal announcements before or since then combined. All righty. And again, uh, on page uh, 22 or 26 of your book, Called to Prepare, I'm going to ask Yvonne if she would read that portion for us. William Boggs tells in one of his books about the advice given to him upon visiting a peach orchard. He said an old man, as wrinkled as a peach tent himself, and who was tending the place, said, Quote, if you really want the best fruit, go deeper into the orchard. The peaches along the fringes are picked over, but deeper into the orchard you'll find the best fruit. Go deeper, the best fruit farther in. Unquote. An old idiom put this another way. Quote, going out on a limb, unquote, the idiom means that even though it's risky, sometimes you have to do or say something that is different. You have to try something new to accomplish a greater or higher goal. When she realized that she could only get at the best fruit by leaving the comfort zone, Sarah tried something totally different by putting her faith in Jesus. And that decision led her onto more risky limbs. She went out on a limb of reconciliation to meet an estranged friend with forgiveness and love. She went out on the limb of intimacy, where she let go of her pride and disclosed her thinking, hurting, and dreaming self to her parents. She went out onto the limb of service, overcoming her personal resistance by volunteering at a pregnancy center. And through the whole process, she found herself out on the limb of healing, where God was calling her to accept emotional and spiritual balm for some long-festering wounds. Quote, 
to hold the turtle, unquote. James Bryant Conant said, quote, he makes progress only when he sticks his neck out, end quote. Right, thank you, Yvonne. We have three questions that the author gives us here. What comfort zones do you need to leave so Jesus can totally change you? And again, these are self-thought questions. And I, 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 as I've read them and thought about them, I could give you some illustrations. But I'm going to leave it up for you. Are you leaving comfort zones? Are you getting out there and, and allowing Jesus to change your life, lives with the words that you read? and with the uh, circumstances that he brings into your life. Think about that. Two, what risky limbs have you climbed out on in the past for Christ's sakes? sake? Are you taking chances for Jesus? Are you putting yourself out there? Three, how did you grow spiritually from stepping out on those risky limbs? In other words, once we... Uh, grow for Christ, once we do something for Christ, it's always a good idea to self-evaluate how that's helped us grow, what it's brought out in our spiritual maturity in our life, okay? So again, self-help questions there that you can read. Okay, next we're going to go to uh, page 23 here, and we're going to read Matthew 3, 1 through 6, and I'd like for you to pick out these points as Yvonne reads that scripture for us here. Number one, John the Baptist came preparing hearts for Jesus, preaching repentance. Two, he was a voice crying in the wilderness, just as Isaiah predicted. Three, John wore camel hair garments and a leather belt and ate locusts and honey. Four, many came to see John from Jerusalem and Judea, and he baptized them as they confessed their sins. Matthew 3, 1 through 6. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come to you. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Okay, and you can follow along with me in the book if you'd like. As it reads, as a part of the preparation to receive their king, John told his listeners to repent of their sins because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. In other words, Jesus was coming into the world and we need to prepare ourselves. It takes me back to a time in Israel's history Whenever the God was going to meet with the children of Israel as they started their uh, wilderness journeyings after they left Egypt. And he was going to meet with them on, on the mountaintop. And he was going to speak to the children of Israel as a congregation. And he told them to go home, or told Moses to tell them, go home and wash their cells and change their clothes and put on uh, clean clothing and prepare themselves before they met at the foot of the, or the base of the mountain with their holy God. So in other words, John the Baptist, in the likeness of uh, the prophet Isaiah here, is going uh, before and a forerunner of Jesus Christ, telling the people to prepare their hearts and their spiritual lives. In other words, confess your sin, turn away from your sin, and when, once you turn away from it, remain away from it. Prepare your heart because the Holy One, Jesus, the King, is coming. To receive their King properly, the people's hearts needed to be right. Unlike earthly kings who can look only upon the outward appearance of people, 
the Lord can see into their hearts. And because the Lord can see people's hearts and motives to receive him properly, their hearts need to be dealt with appropriately. Hundreds of years earlier, the prophet Isaiah had foretold John's ministry of preparing the people for their king. We look in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. John the Baptist would be the voice of one in the wilderness calling the people to make the way straight for the Lord. When we think of a straight line, the idea of the shortest distance between two points likely comes to mind. However, the word used for straight in both the Hebrew and the Greek carries that they should believe upon the one who came after John. Name, or excuse me, I jumped up the wrong line there. The Greek carries with, the, with it the idea of being right and good. Therefore, the one who would come to prepare the way of the Lord was to make his path right and good for the people to receive him properly. And they had to get their hearts right first and repent. As a result, many people came to confess their sins and be baptized by John. This is what the people were doing in preparation to receive their king then, and this is what people still need to do in preparation to receive him today. Okay, our author asks us uh, three questions here. Question number four asks, what was the content of John's message in the wilderness? Well, it was repent, turn from your sin. You're about to encounter your king face to face. Get ready. Secondly, question number five, what was the purpose of John's message in the wilderness? Purpose was to prepare, to make straight the way of the Lord, to get ready for Jesus, to get the hearts of people ready. Not just the walkway, but the hearts of people, because that's what Jesus came into the world to affect, is the spirit and the heart of man. How did the people respond to John's message? Those who initially heard John's message responded by confessing their sin. And again, I'll remind you, to confess sin means to look at sin the way that God sees it. Not the way that mankind sees it, or not the way I see it, or you see it, but the way God sees it. Well, how do we know how God sees sin? By knowing the Word of God. By committing it to our hearts, not only through memory, but through application of the principle of the Word of God. Look at your life and your effort to live a right life through God's eyes to confess sin, and that's what they did. They confessed their sin, and then they repented of it, turned away from it, and afterwards they gave a physical rendering of an identification, not only with John, but with the Messiah, the king that he was making the way for. They were baptized, agreeing with John's ministry. Okay, the next section here in Matthew uh, 3, 7 through 10, it says provoking hearts. Three points here we want to pick out as Yvonne reads for us. First, John conformed, um, excuse me, John confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees for making baptism outward show rather than bearing fruit through true repentance. In other words, they were using uh, just word of mouth. They were mouthing the fact that they were interested and loved God. It was just an outward thing with them. Secondly, Pharisee, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were wrongly trusting in their ethnic heritage as children of Abraham for their source of right standing with God. And then third, but John said that everyone who does not bear fruit through true repentance will face eternal consequences. 
Yvonne, if you'd read for us, please. Matthew 3, 7 through 10. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, quote, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. All righty, our commentary here on page 25 says, Jewish religious leaders of that day, he called them a brood of vipers. That uh, John's approach was provocative indicates that sometimes people need a wake-up call to see how far from God they are. After referring to the religious leaders as vipers, John then asked who had warned them about the wrath that was coming. He challenged them to show the fruit that is the product of true faith and repentance. Today, those whose hearts are hard against the things of God need to understand that through that though he is patient, his patience has its limits. There will be consequences for the continued re rejection of God's Son. John uh, told, also told the religious leaders that their faith in being children of Abraham was misplaced that God could turn stones into children of Abraham, demonstrated that physical lineage had absolutely nothing to do with their spiritual standing before God. Likewise, people today need to be aware, uh, need to beware of the potential for misplaced faith. A person raised in a Christian home doesn't automatically become a child of God. If there was ever a group of people who might have confidence that their good works and religious position could uh, make them right with God, it was these religious leaders. However, no amount of religious work can make us right with God. Only by turning from our sins, and that's repentance, folks, and trusting the Savior for forgiveness from sin, and we call that true faith, trusting God. Can we have a right relationship with God and escape the wrath to come? Question number seven asks us, what group of people came to where John was baptizing, and what did he call them? Okay, once again, they were the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were the religious leaders of that time. And he called them uh, a brood or a group of vipers or snakes. In other words, their mind wasn't right here. And that's what John was calling out. And sometimes we need to do that. Sometimes you'll hear preachers get a little uh, forward and a little strong with their language and call sin, sin. And remind people that uh, lying and cheating and, and infidelity and uh, drunkenness and all these things are sin against the holy God. And people don't like it. We like to be able to do what we want to do and so on. But sometimes we need to call sin what it is. It, it's transgression against the holy God. And we need to point it out to, to the people so the people can know this and understand it and remember it. And hopefully we do it with uh, an idea of love and an idea of mercy and grace. But it, it's God's word, and it, it must be spoken. It must be dealt out, and it must be done in love. I think it's in the book of Galatians where God tells us that if we see a brother in a fault, we're to go to them in love and point that fault out to them, to, to reprove them. And that's what God calls upon us to do. And that's about what John the Baptist was doing here. He was calling sin, sin, and calling it out for what it was. Question number nine. 
Uh, excuse me, I'm jumping ahead there too far. Question number eight. What did John say they were relying on to be right with God? Well, John said, you folks are relying on your heritage. The fact that you are Jewish people from Abraham. You are God's chosen people. But still, even God's chosen people had to, as much as they could, follow the will and the law of God. Uh, and they had to put forth that effort and trust in God. As a matter of fact, I like to remind people, as you and I today look back on the cross of Calvary, then the people in the Old Testament, these folks that John were talking to, had to look forward to the coming of the Messiah and his death and burial and resurrection. Now, they probably didn't have a good idea of all that, but they knew the Messiah was coming. And they had to look ahead and believe on that Messiah that would come. And these folks had gotten away from that. Even the teachers of the law had gotten away from that. They'd settled in that, well, I, I, I'm a, a child of Abraham. I, I'm in the Jewish nation, so I'm okay. You know, we fall into that a lot of times when we say, well, I was raised in church. I'm a church member. You know, I, I try to be good, but that won't get you to heaven, folks. And that's what John's getting across here. Number nine, what warning did John have for them? The warning was, unless they truly turn from their sins, showing fruit of repentance, okay? Those things go together. We must turn from our sins, even when we confess and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and accept Christ as our Savior, we must turn from our sins. There has to be a change in our life. And then our life needs to show forth an example of, and a fruit of repentance. People ought to be able to see us before and after and understand that something's different in John's life. He's changed. He's not the man he used to be. Something new has come into his life to make him more righteous, more pure, more holy, if I can use that terminology. But there's a difference. If we don't do it, if we don't show fruit, John tells the Pharisees and the Sadducees that we'll be cut down like firewood and cast into the fire. In other words, folks, when you become a born-again child of God, again, I said this previously, there has to be a difference in your life. Change comes from the inside. Uh, the Bible talks about in the New Testament that we have a renewing of our mind. The Spirit of God, the Word of God, re renews the way we think, the way we make our decisions, even the way we talk. And that's part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The moment that you do accept Christ as your Savior, the Spirit comes to indwell your heart and your life. And one of the ministries He has there is to convince us of sin, of sinful ways, to reprove us of that, and then guide us in correction in that area as we read the Word, and as we get together with God's people, and as we pray, and as God, through the Holy Spirit, guides us in that way. All right, our next section is titled, Prevailing Upon Hearts, and we're reading from Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. And uh, the points we want to pick out here, if I can find them here, will be three. John baptized people with water, but he said a greater baptism through Christ was coming with the Holy Spirit and fire for the true repentance. Secondly, John said that Jesus would gather those who truly repented, but unquenchable fire awaits for those that did not follow him. Third, that meant there will be eternal consequences for rejecting Christ as Lord and Savior. Yvonne, would you read Matthew 3, 11 and 12, please? Quote, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. 
he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Okay, Yvonne, if you would, go ahead and read the commentary for us. Just before their true king made his public appearance to be baptized, verses 13 through 17, John prevails upon his listeners one more time to be prepared to receive their king. The humble prophet understood his proper place with the Lord, declaring that he was not even worthy to carry Jesus' shoes. John baptized with the water of repentance, but he who is greater and more powerful than John was baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Both here at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry and later at the end of it, we find the promise of the Spirit's wonderful work in the lives of believers. When Jesus was about to depart by way of Calvary's cross, he eased his disciples' troubled hearts promise that he would send them the comforter, the Holy Spirit, who would abide with them forever, John 14, 16. John earnestly prevailed upon his listeners to understand that every person must choose which fire they will ultimately face. Those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will be baptized by the Holy Spirit and fire. A picture of purification from the refuge of sin and a person's life. However, those who reject Jesus will face the unquenchable fires of judgment, like useless chaff that is left over from the harvest. Like John's listeners some 2,000 years ago, people today have the same choice of which fire they will ultimately face. All righty, as we go on to question number 10, Though John was fear, a fearless prophet, how did he demonstrate true humility? Well, he demonstrated it because he, he stated that even though his message was short and sweet and to the point, and they were the words of God because he was a messenger of God, there was one to come behind him, as John stated, that John was not even worthy to, to unloose the latches, as the King James says, or to carry the sandals of Jesus Christ, one of the lowest uh, actions of a servant in the household. He wasn't worthy for that. And that comes to us as Christians, too. Once we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. As the book of Ephesians tells us, we already set in heavenly places in the eyes of God. And we have the power to be all that God calls upon us to be. And we are royalty. We are children of the king. But we can't live on those laurels and rest on those laurels. Because it's only because of the love of God and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are who we are in Christ. Actually, we're just sinners saved by grace. And we need to keep that in mind and keep a humble spirit as we proclaim the truth of the Word of God and not get haughty on our own side. It's very easy to do. Satan has brought down many a, a Christian and many a preacher by swelling them up with pride. And we need to keep a humble heart and a humble spirit and realize that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But on my own, I can do nothing. All my righteousness is filthy rags before God. But if I take his righteousness, I can proclaim truth, and he will have his will and way in other people's lives through me. So we need to join with John on that and stay humble as we preach and teach and guide other people to a saving knowledge and a walk with Jesus Christ in this world. Question 11. How did John's baptism and the Lord's differ? Okay. Verses 14 through 
okay? John stated here that he would baptize with water. All right, we still baptize with water. Now, water baptism does not save anyone. Water baptism is not a part of the salvation process. It's a picture to the world. It's a witness to the world of what has taken place in their life. Whenever we come to Jesus Christ and accept his salvation, accept him as Savior, and give him the lordship of our life, then God tells us, Jesus did, that we need to be baptized. We need to put on a little skit, a play, for a group of people so that we can demonstrate to them that I spiritually have died and was buried with Christ under the waters and rose in newness of life as I come out of the water. I've died in Christ to the old man died and the new spiritual man has risen. That's about water baptism. It's, it's only a, a figure of what's already taken place. I like to say a skit or a play acting. We're showing people. However, Jesus, John said, would come and he would baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. So whenever you are born again, whenever you accept Christ as your Savior, wherever it is, whether you're bound in front of a church at a kneeling altar, accepting Christ as your Savior, or whether it's at your bedside, whenever you've been praying to God and you turn your life and your heart over to Him and you accept Him as your Savior and your Lord, the Holy Spirit baptizes you. He comes into your heart. He comes into your being, but he baptizes you into the family of God. And whenever he baptizes you, he gives you the power to do away with that old man, to wash it away. It's not the waters that wash away sin. It's the Holy Spirit. But we have to be willing to join our spirit with the spirit and let that cleansing agent take place. Just like if I get into the shower, and I take soap and pour it over my head and get under the water and rinse it off, I'm not clean. The Holy Spirit, soap, is going to help me get clean, but i got to take that rag and i got to rub and scrub, and depending on how many grease and, and soot and whatever I've got on myself, scrub a little harder, but I've got a, I've got a purpose, I've got an action to do in that. The Holy Spirit does it, the soap is what gets me clean, but I'm the one that helps that soap work. And so in our Christian life, when the Holy Spirit baptizes us and washes away the sin of our life, then we have to start learning how to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, how to walk and talk anew. Paul says once again, we take off the old man, we put on the new man. So the difference in water baptism, or John's baptism and Jesus' baptism, was the fact that Jesus baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. And the fire is the, uh, what do I want to say, the, the fervent part. In other words, if we'll allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and our lives, he'll give us a drive to be who God wants us to be. He will give us that fire within our heart, within our being, within our souls. Question number 12. What final warning uh, that, uh, excuse me, yeah, what final warning did John give his listeners? What was, what was the warning that he gave? Okay, a harvest is coming. A harvest. Jesus is coming. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. Several judgments coming in the future. I don't have time to preach on them. But know that there's the judgment seat of Christ, happened right after the rapture. And then there's the great white throne judgment that will happen at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. Which judgment seat will you set before? A harvest is coming, okay? Those who are the Lord's, by faith, having faith in him, would be gathered like fruitful wheat into barns. And those who are not his would be fanned like the useless chaff into the flames of judgment. Again, 
Are you going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ because you're a born-again child of God? Or will you be forced to stand before the great white throne judgment because you never accepted what Jesus Christ offered on the cross as payment for your sin and returned yourself back to him as Lord of your life? It's your decision. That's what we're talking about all through this study this semester are decisions. The decisions we make affect what happens not only in this life, but in eternity. Alrighty, we're going to go to page 27, and then we'll get Yvonne to read our final uh, story here. True repentance leads to change. Yvonne, if you would, please. What is true repentance? It is more than just merely saying, I'm sorry. It's more than just empty promises of, quote, I won't do that again, unquote. These fruitless actions barely even scrape the surface and are not true repentance. The Greek word for repentance, metatonia, tonia, breaks down into two parts. Meta, meaning change, and noia, meaning mind. Metanoia is the root of the English word used earlier in this lesson, metamorphosis, the transformational process of a caterpillar changing into a butterfly. The Holy Spirit renews our minds, Romans 12, 2, through the Word of God. Only the Word of God can transform our minds into the likeness of Christ, Ephesians 4, 23, and 24. God's word is the truth that sets us free. John 8, 32. To be, all, to be all God has called us to be. A change of mind leads to a change of heart. It is much more than merely the emotion of worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. 7, changing our mind and heart involves changing the direction of our spiritual walk. It is as if we are walking one direction and we turn completely in the opposite direction. We turn away from our sin and we turn completely towards Christ in obedience to his commands and purposes. When we spiritually change our direction, we change our lifestyle as well as our destiny. When God calls us to repent, he calls for us to change everything about us. It has been said that to, quote, sow a thought is to reap an action. To sow an action is to reap a habit. To sow a habit is to reap a lifestyle. And to sow a lifestyle All righty, again, our thought questions that we're going to think on this week. Number 13, why is true repentance more than being sorry for what you have done? If you can't put an answer to it, go back through the lesson, reread, understand it. If you still can't put an answer to it, give me a call. We'll talk about it on the phone. 14. How fruitful is your spiritual life for Christ? What inhibits maximum fruit production? Number 15. How have the Holy Spirit and the Word, that's the Word of God, transformed your life into Christ's likeness? What further changes are needed. This metamorphosis that we go through as born-again children of God, preparing for eternity with God, is never-ending in this world. We will be perfect whenever God changes us in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump of the trumpet, the book of uh, Thessalonians tells us, the dead in Christ, if we've already died, we will rise from the grave, our 
souls that have went to be with Jesus Christ will come back with him in the air, and they'll be reunited. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the air. At that moment, we will receive our glorified bodies. At that moment, we will be recreated into perfect beings as God created Adam and Eve in the beginning. And we'll have full fellowship with God. But on this side of the rapture, folks, on this side of the rapture, we are sinful beings. We are not perfect, okay? So what we need to be is continually taking off the old man and putting on the new. I'd like to thank Yvonne for helping me with Sunday school this morning. I think it gave me more of a resemblance of what we have whenever we're together face to face. And I appreciate her taking uh, the time to be with me and ministering with me here today. Let's have a word of prayer as we close. Father, we give you glory and praise once again. And Father, as we think about being prepared in the sense for your coming, for your work in our life, preparing ourselves for eternity with you and ministry in this world. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, who is not only uh, omnipresent in all places and, and, and everywhere, but he's, he stays always in our heart. And he gives us certain ministries and powers and abilities. And, Father, he causes us to have the strength and the courage to do the things you call us to do. And I thank you for it, Lord. And I pray you will be with us. Pray, Father, that you'll be with our nation. It's been a great nation, a good Christian nation, a godly nation in the past. It would be my prayer, Father, that you would bring us back as close to that once again as is possible within your plan and your will for this world. Let your will be done. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, and I'll have a video up for our morning worship service. And also keep an eye out for our children's story, which should be on here too. God bless you until we meet again. Please stay tuned. Our morning worship service will start immediately following this tape. Good morning, this is Pastor John Townsend with First Grace Brethren Church in Altoona, Pennsylvania. We welcome you to our morning worship service, December 27, 2020. It's great to have you with us this morning. Uh, we want to remember this morning uh, that um, we are working with our prayer list, and I try to get those out to you each week. And so if you're not receiving them, but you'd like to, or if you have some questions or various other things, you can contact me uh, either on my cell phone, or you can get me at uh, email, jtownsend, Atlantic Broadband, or excuse me, that's jtownsend at atlanticbb.net. Okay, jtownsend at atlanticbb.net. So you can contact me with anything you'd like to share. I would like to take the opportunity this morning to thank all of our people that have sent out the uh, uh, cards and the uh, gifts of love. Uh, they have been received warmly, and I thank you very much. I'll say uh, a post Merry Christmas to you, and looking forward to, to having a uh, blessed New Year as we go into 2021. All righty. Uh, do remember our uh, worship through tithe. We don't want to forget that. Make sure that you get that in either to the church address at 2930 Maple Avenue, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 16601. Or you can uh, let me know and I'll uh, get it in to Allen. I'll get it in if you get it to the church here. Uh, if you want to drop it off the church, that's fine. Most of you folks that are regulars have some keys out there, so... You can do that, and I'll pick it up there at the church and make sure Alan gets it. Okay, also we want to uh, be thinking about the verse of the year. Uh, we're going to try to uh, start having some semblance of gathering for service, 
and I've been praying about it, and uh, the Lord's kind of laying on my heart that maybe we'll do what some of our other churches are doing to start with, and that's having a uh, drive-in service in the back parking lot. Um, I'd like to get your ideas on that, so if you would, uh, email me or give me a call or you know, let me know one way or another there how you feel about uh, having a drive-in service where you'd actually come in your car like you would at a drive-in movie theater, and I'll have it set up to where you can receive uh, anything that's done on the uh, rise or the totem uh, through your car radio. There's a technology for that to where we can broadcast it and you can pick it up on FM radio. So if that's something that would appeal to you, it would be safe from uh, the COVID. Uh, everyone could stay in their own cars, uh, yet we could see each other. And uh, actually, I uh, was thinking it might even be possible that while we're having our uh, uh, drive-in service, uh, we could bring up a uh, Zoom meeting uh, on your uh, smartphones, and that way you folks could talk to each other if you wanted to. Uh, during and before and after worship and so on and so forth. But some ideas going there. I just want to know how you'd cotton to that and whether or not you'd be willing to support it. So let me know uh, if you'd be up for a drive-in uh, church before we get back to just going into the church and meeting full-time together. Okay, well, welcome this morning. I trust that you've had a, a good Christmas uh, I pray it's been a blessed one and a happy one for you. I do know that we've got some of our uh, members and friends out here that have lost loved ones uh, here recently. And the first Christmas is always a hard one. So I've been thinking of you and praying for you and asking God to give you uh, a special dose of that comfort of the Holy Spirit that he already gives us there within your heart and your being. It's it's really a blessing to me, and I know it is to you folks, to realize and to feel the uh, comfort and the closeness and the love of God through the Holy Spirit that indwells our hearts and our lives. So I've been praying for you folks and for others who've been going through uh, various uh, medical things, uh, whether it be um, some of you going through the surgeries and some of you have been having colds and some of you are going through uh, diseases and things uh, that are wrong uh, with your physical beings uh, and we've got a prayer list and we've been praying for you so let's keep that up to date you keep praying for others but uh, I'm praying that God will just give you strength okay and guide you through okay well let's open up our service this morning uh, and go to prayer Let's bow our heads together. Gracious Heavenly Father, today we come before you and we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor. You are the Almighty King, the God of the universe. You are a creator. And as we're going to talk about today, some of the names that uh, is the nation of Israel would call you and you instruct them, and even sometimes names you'd call yourself in the Hebrew tongue that sort of brought out more the character of who you are. And God, we want to know those things. We want to hold on to them because you do not only love us, but you care for us and you guide us moment by moment and day by day. And you, Almighty Father, are in charge of all that goes on. We don't have to, as we don't have to as Christians, as born-again children of God, we don't have to worry about the future. You've got it in your hands. As the old song used to sing, you've got the whole world in your hands. And Lord, we trust you and we thank you. It's a great comfort uh, to us, Father, to know that we serve a, a, a living, loving, awesome God who is in control of all things, past, present, and future. You know what's coming. You've got our best in mind. And Lord, you love us so much that you want the best for each and every one of us, collectively and individually. So we put our whole trust and faith in you. And we give you all praise and glory and honor this day. Help us, Lord, as we worship you and think about your word, even though we're separated, that, Father, jointly through our spirits, 
we will touch your spirit. And in doing so, Father, that we will feel your closeness and your love. And as we look at your word and we study it, and we understand it better, Lord, that we might know you better. And in knowing you, give you the glory and praise and honor and have the faith in you that you call upon us to do. And Father, as we think about that faith, I realize, Father, it's not my faith for you, but rather your faith that I uh, uh, tie into, that I appropriate, and I have your faith through me to you, and I give you all praise, all glory, and all honor. You are the great God, the awesome God of the universe. Amen. All righty, today as we uh, approach the word, I uh, prayed and asked, you know, the Lord and sort of search for where do we go? We've been talking about uh, uh, why it was that uh, Jesus came into the world and uh, what that meant to us and what a glorious time it is. I know a couple of weeks back we talked about we, we've read the end of the book. We know what's coming and we can look forward to uh, seeing you and being with you throughout all eternity as we look to you, Father. Uh, so that's what I've been talking with him about back and forth. And I say, Lord, what do you want me to bring your people uh, aware of this week? What, what is the thing that you, through your spirit towards us, would have our spirits towards you to hold to? What would give us hope and faith? Because you folks know that we're going through quite a rough patch of time in this world and in this nation. Uh, what with the uh, pandemic, uh, you know, but God knows about that. And we're going to talk about that today a little bit. He knows what has happened, is happening, and is going to happen. And he's got our backs. So my question is, what can I share with you today that will give you the hope? and give you the understanding that born again children of God, and I go to that phrase quite often, folks, because the uh, love of God blankets over all men, but the blessings of God are withheld for God's people. And God's people are those people who have made a decision to turn from their wicked ways, to give their volition back to God to accept what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, accept him as Savior, and then live this life with him as their Lord. That's God's people. You see God's people and you know God's people by the decisions they make, the way they talk, the way they walk, the way they act. Because whenever you look at God's people, you see Jesus. And if you're looking at someone and you don't see Jesus, it's very, very likely that they're not one of the true children of God. They've never accepted him. So that's a qualifier here, okay? The qualifier to have the blessing of God and be able to have the peace that passes all understanding in the Lord Jesus Christ is knowing him as Savior of your life and yielding to him the lordship of your life. And that's a very uh, uh, standard tenement of, of my messages and my preaching because it has to be there. All too often in this sinful world, we think that if we just do lip service, as we talked about last week when we were talking about Herod, if we just do lip service to the Lord, then it's okay. God will look over what we're doing and we'll be okay with with our relationship with God, but that's the furthest thing from the truth. As a matter of fact, to put it in the vernacular of the old evangelists that I listened to growing up, that's a lie from the pits of hell, folks. The truth is, you must be born again. Jesus told Nicodemus that plainly. You must be born again. If you're not born again, you can't even see or know the kingdom of heaven. So it must come that decision first. So that's a qualifier that you're going to hear from this preacher all along as I preach. If you want the blessings of God, if you want the promises of God to be real in your life, if you want to know the victory and the peace 
and the joy that only the Holy Spirit can give us in our lives, then you must be born again. So I hope I've made that point clear. You can't understand what I talk about. And I know there's a lot of you out there that are listening that uh, my words just fall uh, on deaf ears. I know that the word of God just sounds like some sort of a Greek drama to you. But it's because you don't know Jesus. You don't know the author. You don't know God. You're living in a state that Adam put you in where you're out of fellowship with God. And the first thing that you need to do is to realize that you're a sinner, that Jesus is God, that he came to this world. He died on the cross of Calvary, not for anything he did. He was perfect. He was sinless. But he died for your sin. And then he was buried. He rose again and ascended back into glory and promised to come again to receive us unto himself. And in doing all that, he had victory over death, sin, and the grave. And that victory can be yours as you, if you do exactly what Jesus told Nicodemus. You must be born again. You must believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe who he is. And if you truly believe, then it's going to cause a change in your life. You're going to be different from the person you were from uh, before the time that you made a decision to follow Christ. Alrighty, so as we go on today, now we're going to talk uh, first, I'm going to take you back to the book of Isaiah. And we're going to talk about some Old Testament prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the death of Jesus Christ. Now, I like that scripture because in it we're going to read a couple of the names that Jesus uh, and God the Father and Jesus had for themselves, the eternal God. And then once we read those scriptures, I'm going to take you into some of the names that God called himself in the Word. As a matter of fact, they're names of who he wants to be toward his people, the children of Israel and also the church of today. And the names that he was called, uh, or that he gave himself, are very telling as to who he is and the character of himself, and even the attributes of himself. So if you will, get your Bibles, and I hope you follow me in the Bible. I uh, generally read whenever I do scripture. Sometimes I do the uh, King James. That's what I came up in. That's what I studied all through school, and and in the early part of my messages and all. And, but I always like to go to some of the uh, more modern uh, translations. Okay, and uh, NIV is the one I generally fall on. Just because it, it rolls off the tongue a little better for your listening, basically. I've gotten used to the old English and King James. And I, I can pick it up pretty good and move it around in my mind where I understand what's going on. But if you're not used to that, it's hard for you. So, so what I do is I'll uh, read from the uh, New American, or excuse me, uh, the New International Version, the NIV, and that's what I want to do today. But we're going to go back to the book of Isaiah, okay? Isaiah chapter 9, so get your Bible, read along with me. If you happen to be reading the uh, King James, then bear with me a little bit, but I'm reading from the NIV. And it's not all that different, but it is just a little bit in the way that we, uh, you know, get a quicker understanding of it. Okay, so uh, open your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to be reading the totality of that chapter. And then we're going over, or no, we're just going to read the first half of 9. And then we're going over to uh, chapter 53. Okay. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and in the land of Nephili. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea and beyond Jordan. Now, I'm going to take a break here and I'm going to remind you, you have to remember that uh, Isaiah, the prophet, is talking to the nation of Israel. 
there was a difference from between the nation of Israel and the church. The difference is that the nation of Israel is God's chosen people in the Old Testament, and he worked with them through the Old Testament. But when Jesus came in the New Testament and started his ministry and rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, the uh, Jewish nation rejected Jesus. And Jesus took and set them aside. Now, he didn't set aside who he is or what he came to do or the understanding of what he created and how he plans the world to play out. All that's still going on. It's an ongoing saga. He's just changed the main character. He's taken Israel and set them on a shelf for a moment in time. And what my teachers and professors back in college used to say, he, he declared a divine time out with Israel. In other words, if you're playing a basketball game, uh, you, you, the coach or the captain of the team uh, can, can raise up and say, time, time, time. And what happens whenever you have a timeout is the game is still ongoing, but the clock stops. That big clock up in the center of the auditorium up there, it stops and then the time is not in play. So the time for Israel is not in play. If you go back, and I haven't got time today to preach on the 70 weeks of Daniel, but the 70th week of Daniel has not happened. The first 69 weeks have happened. We're in a divine timeout with Israel concerning how God is dealing with them. And later on, as a matter of fact, it's going to be whenever the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation begins, that's when God will start back dealing with Israel. But in, in the meantime here, from the, the uh, triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, okay, on Palm Sunday, and the day of what we call the rapture of the church, that period of time is known as the church age. And God is not dealing with Israel as a nation, but he's dealing with the church, with his church. All that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and truly accept him. Again, I'll go back to the verbiage that Jesus uses. Everyone that's born again. That's a born-again child of God. A true born-again child of God is in the church of the church age. Now, even though the panoramic of the uh, plan that God has is continuing, we see that God is changing the particular peoples in a certain time and certain era or a certain dispensation, if you want to put it that way, he's dealing directly with, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that God's not going to deal with any Israeli people or Jewish people today. There are Messianic Jews, Jews who believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and they come to a believing faith in Jesus Christ, and they are a part of the universal church, of the church of God. So he's dealing with that. So as we talk about the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, Yes, Isaiah is speaking to them, but God is prophetically telling us what's going to happen with the church age. And he's talking about what's going to happen not only during the church age, but after the church age, whenever he starts dealing with Israel again. So we can't just throw out the Old Testament so that doesn't apply to us, especially not this one, because in uh, Isaiah chapter 9 here, we're going to start reading about the uh, prophecies of Jesus coming into the world to be our Savior, okay? So in verse 2 of chapter 9 in Isaiah, it says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the deep darkness, a light is dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as a people rejoice at harvest. As warriors rejoice when dividing plunder. For as in the days of the Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. The crossbar of the shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be the fuel for the fire. Now he's looking ahead there to when Jesus comes on his second advent. Not the first advent, but the second advent. 
and whenever he destroys the evil of this world and all is going to be taken down and we're going to be lifted and we're going to be in that time uh, I talked about a couple of weeks ago whenever I was talking about we know the end of the book we know what's going to happen when all tears will be dried up and there'll be no more sorrow and no more pain and we'll live under the righteousness of Jesus Christ for all eternity you see God's going to take care of that we see that ahead well, how's that going to come about? He starts to tell us that in chapter or verse 6 here of chapter 9. Because we're going to start seeing the prophecy of the first advent of Jesus Christ, the first coming of Jesus Christ into the world. Verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. And he shall be called, now listen to this, these are the names that I was talking about. We're going to open up and expand on this in a little bit. And he shall be called a Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and uphold it with justice and righteousness from time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Okay? In other words, Jesus, or, uh, Isaiah, God through Isaiah has covered uh, time of uh, the tribulation. He's covered the time of uh, the millennium. He's covered the end times that will come. He's covered the time coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the first advent, all these things in the prophecy. Now, as Isaiah was looking ahead for this, and he was talking to the people of his day and giving them hope and saying, this is our great hope because a child will be born to us. He already has for you and me. He has already been born. We celebrated that two days ago whenever we celebrated Christmas. That Jesus had come, glory to God, and praise the Lord. Our Redeemer has come into the world, and he's redeemed us from sin. He's conquered Satan. Now, Satan doesn't know it yet because God's allowing him to be the prince of the power of the air at this moment. But he is conquered, and we know he's conquered. And we know that we are on the victor's side. Amen? Amen. Okay, now, leaf ahead. I don't have time to, to linger here too much. Might have lingered a little longer than I should already. But leaf ahead to the, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And let's look and see what happened and, and get a glimpse. You, you remember this is thousands of years before Jesus actually came on the scene at his first advent, baby in a manger, and going to the cross of Calvary. But God's giving hope to the children of Israel and telling them about his coming and what would happen. And we take it as proof that Jesus was who he said he was and who we believe he is because he covered and he uh, actually lived out all of this prophecy we're going to read here. Isaiah 53, 1. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, one like from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet he consider, we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each one of us, has turned to his own way. And the Lord laid, uh, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, by righteous servant will justify many, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. Folks, that is prophecy of the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah in particular, that talked about the coming of the Messiah of the Jewish nation. Talked about the coming of the Savior of the world the one who would get us back into the relationship with God that we had before Adam's sin and Adam's fall. And everything that I read there from the Old Testament and the book of Isaiah, thousands of years, thousands of years before Jesus actually came into the world through Mary and was the babe in the manger and grew into manhood in this world and went to the cross He fulfilled every one of those prophecies and all the prophecies of the Old Testament that foretold his coming. Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Messiah of mankind. Okay? Now, what does that do for us? Once we come, as I talked a while ago about, come to a point where we accept Jesus Christ as the Savior, we give him the sin of Adam that we bear, our sins, and we take from him his righteousness, his holiness, his purity, and we allow him to be our Savior because he died for us. We accept that true and perfect gift from him, and we decide to turn our lives back over to him and allow him to be Lord of our life. Now, what do we have to look forward to? Well, the names of God, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Yeah, they're great. But there are also names. As a matter of fact, like the one that uh, Jesus told Moses at the burning bush there. Yahweh, I am, the self-existent one. God was not created. God will not be uh, disannulled, finished, over with, uh, go into uh, extinction. Can't happen. With God, there was no beginning and no end. He was Yahweh. I am the self-existent one. Our God was called Adonai. Adonai. God is the Lord over all. God is Lord over all. That's Genesis 15, Judges 6, all through the body. Adonai. Adonai. You are the Lord over all things. All strength. He was called Yahweh Roi. Yahweh Roi means the Lord my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leaves me beside still waters. David said those things. A comfort. We can be comforted because this God who is self-existent, this God who is God over everything and all things, he is preeminent in all things. He is our shepherd. And the shepherd shows the love that he has for his people. Yahweh, 
Shema, Lord who is present. Once you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, your spirit is quickened and you're back in touch with God. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He is the one that sticks closer than a brother. He is the one that is there through every aspect of life. You remember the poem that's out there that talks about uh, how that there were two sets of footprints in the sand. And when things were going along fine, these two sets of footprints represented man and God walking together. But then when the hard times come, and, and the man looked at the footprints. He only saw one set of footprints. And automatically in his mind, he looked to, the, to God and to Jesus and said, Well, where were you when I was going through such heartache, such pain, and such trouble? And the poem goes on to say that I was there. But Lord, there's only one set of footprints. And the Lord says, I was carrying you, my son, I was carrying you. He's always with us. Yahweh Shamaha. Yahweh Rapha. The Lord is my healer. Yahweh. Now that word Yahweh can also be translated as Jehovah. And a lot of people use that. Jehovah Rapha. Okay. He is my healer. He heals me. In other words, God cares about you. And whenever you fall into sickness and pain and suffering, and he doesn't have a purpose and a will for you to be there, and he's not teaching you something through that, then it's his will to heal you. He will and can heal you. Our God is a God of miracles. He still does miracles today. If I had the time today, I could go through several in my life life-threatening miracles to my family and myself there were no explanation from any doctor anywhere but God is healed already Yahweh Jireh the Lord will provide now that's a good one for us today we are going through some hard times with the COVID shutdown many of you folks out there are out of work and uh, money's not flowing as good as it could. Uh, everybody looking forward and hope that we get this uh, relief that the government's coming. And that's good. God uses that. He'll use the government to help us out. But you don't have to worry if you're a true born-again child of God. You have faith in God. You have trust in God. You pray to your God who names himself Jehovah Jireh or Yahweh Jireh. In other words, he provides for you, and he will provide. He will not leave you to, to suffer or to starve. And then there's always Yahweh Nisi, who is the Lord, our banner. Now that projects the banner that goes before the army in the battle. He is the one that will fight the battle. Yes, we're going through a battle, and if you are a Christian, that votes on the what they call the right side, the other right side and the left side uh, of our politics these days, then you feel like we're in a battle. and We've got a man in the White House that's fighting that battle to try to keep us on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ and the side uh, of righteousness and holiness, okay? And we're fighting a battle, but it's not that man in the White House that is the main one. Now, God will use him, and God will strengthen him. And I'm with Billy Graham on that. I back that man in the White House, and I believe that God has put him there for a purpose right now. And I pray for him on a daily basis that God will strengthen him and, and build him up and give him the wisdom and the knowledge and the strength and, uh, and the uh, stamina that he needs to keep going. But he's not the one, you see. We think about God. The eternal one, the, uh, the self-existent one, the all-powerful one, the almighty God. He is Jehovah Nisi. He is our banner. He's the one that leads us through. And yes, he will use other uh, soldiers in the fight. But it's Jesus we follow. It's Jesus who we have our faith in. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit.
Jehovah Nisi. Yahweh Shalom. The Lord is peace. You know, we cry for peace in this world. And those on the left right now are crying for unity and peace and, and for things, you know, people to get along and so on. But man in his own mind, in the fallen mind of man, we can't come up with peace. We don't know peace. Peace is living in right relationship with God, being a born-again child of God, and living under his provision, living under his guidance, living even through his commands and his law and his will. And that's the only way we can have peace. It's never going to be achieved in this world as long as Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Now, I know that even Trump has worked some peace treaties over in the Middle East that uh, we never thought would happen, and, and they're coming together a little bit, you know. But, you know, uh, the Bible tells us that even there, there will never be perfect peace until the next coming, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he sets up his millennial reign in this world. And then when that millennial reign changes over into the eternal reign of Jesus Christ, that will be peace. But you and I, even though Satan is the prince of the power of the air in this world, God is almighty God. He's in charge. And he is Yahweh Shalom. He is Yahweh Shalom. He is peace. And we can know that peace that passes all understanding. You know, I'm running out of time here, but I would like to stop and, and and just talk to you about two different kinds of peace. One is the peace with God, and the other is the peace of God. And you cannot have the peace of God that I'm talking about here and that Israel thought about whenever they called God Yahweh Shalom. You can't have that peace of God until you have peace with God. And again, I reiterate that when we are born, because of the sin of Adam, we are at enmity with God when we come into this world. It is only whenever the Holy Spirit knocks upon our heart's door and we realize through the, the work of the Holy Spirit that we are sinners because Adam sinned and it passed on to us and that we are sinners on our own right. Because of the sin nature, we sin against God. And we realize that, and we come to the realization that my righteousness is filthy rags before God. I can't do anything to make my relationship right with God. But, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus came into this world as a babe in a manger, grew until he was 30 years of age, walked in ministry in this world for a little over three years, went to the cross of Calvary and shed his perfect blood and died and gave up the ghost and bore hell on that cross for you and for me, for our sins. He is the propitiation. He is the perfect lamb of God that shed his blood for us. He gave up the ghost, surrendered his spirit to the Father, went to the tomb, but he rose again third day, victorious over death in the grave. Because he lives, we too can live. He ascended to glory and promised to come back to receive us unto himself. Now folks, if you understand that idea that you are a sinner and you can't get to heaven any other way, it's only one way, Jesus Christ. He said it himself. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you cast your sin upon him, figuratively speaking, on the cross of Calvary, and you accept his righteousness to yourself, and you return the lordship of your life to him and become born again. That's the only way to get to heaven. That's the only way you can know him as Jehovah Shalom. That will give you peace with God. No longer a, 
an enemy of God, but have peace with God. And then once we have peace with God, we start living for the Lord Jesus Christ and understanding his principles and living the life that he created us to live. That is when we have the peace of God the peace that passes all understanding. And we can have that even in this troublesome world. But at first, you must have peace with God. Learn and grow to know Him. Become that child of God that He calls upon you to be. As Paul says it, you take off the old man and you put on the new man. And as you grow and the closer you grow to the Lord Jesus Christ after salvation, the more peace that you can feel, even in turmoil, even in hard times. And folks, I don't doubt that the next four years are going to be some rough years for a born-again child of God. But bar the coming of the Lord, the Lord could come at any minute. The rapture could take place, but bar that, it's going to be rough for us. We're going to need the peace of God. So we need to start learning to live for him, with him. Again, it says that the Israelites spoke of God as Jehovah or Yahweh Sabaoth. He is the Lord of the host. Again, talking about the army, the battle. He is the leader. He is the guy. And then God is called Elohim. Elohim, God is creator, powerful, and mighty Lord. Elohim, all-powerful. And we can trust and have faith in all the rest of this stuff if we have faith in the fact. And if you don't believe that God is all-powerful, folks, I'd have to kind of doubt whether or not you're actually believing in Jesus Christ. Because you have to believe that. He is in control. He is all power. He can do all things. Set aside the philosophical arguments that people come up with. Can God make a rock so big he can't move it? Don't ponder yourself on that. God's got that. God is all powerful. Elohim. El Elyon. The most high God. The most high. Not only is he all powerful. But there is no God over him. There is no being over him. Our God is elevated himself. He has elevated himself. Not anybody else. He elevated himself to the highest pinnacle, the highest point that there is. El Gabor. El Gabor. Mighty God. Not only is he the most high God, but he is the most mighty. Nothing is stronger. Nothing is can overtake him. And once we're in the fold of God, there's nothing can overcome us except God allow it for a season. And he gives us some promises along with the times that we are overtaken sometimes, and God needs us to go through some things to, to work the will that he has for us in our lives. And that's the point that he'll never lay any more on us. Then he'll give us the strength through the Holy Spirit to bear it. We're not on our own. Christ is with us. God is with us. El Olam, the everlasting God, ties in with the idea of him being self-existent. God will never end. He has no beginning, has no end. Several times in the scripture, God and Jesus Christ, God the Father and Jesus Christ, both say through the Spirit, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. And in saying that, he means that he is uh, infinite. No beginning, no end, nowhere in sight. We can trust that we will never have an end as born again children of God because God doesn't have an end. And in the fact of eternity future, every baby that's born in this world will live for eternity. 
Now, when I say live, they'll exist. I should have used that expression. They will exist for all eternity to come. The choice we make about what we're going to do with Jesus Christ, death on the cross of Calvary, determines whether we exist in heaven with him in fellowship or whether we exist in a lake of fire where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and where the spirit does not die. Where are you going to spend eternity? Are you going to spend it with Jesus Christ in heaven? Or are you going to spend it in hell? He is the eternal one. The life that he imparted to us in the womb is eternal. We have a decision to make because of Adam's sin. I hope I've made that clear earlier in this message here. Then finally, I'm going to talk about El Roi. El Roi is the strong one, and that's what El means. It's a compound name. El is the strong one, Roi, who sees. El Roi is the strong one who sees. Brother and sister, you will never be in any place. You will never be living out any scenario of life. You will never be going through anything that your Savior, your God, cannot see you and does not see you. When you become a born-again child of God, God sees you, and he knows what's happening. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows what's going to happen to you before it comes. And that's kind of the idea that the, the Israelis thought about whenever they said El Roi, is my God can see me. You know, when Hagar, if you remember the story of Hagar and Abraham, when uh, she was cast out and she was in the wilderness, she called upon Eroi because God saw her and had mercy on her and her son and even made a nation of her son, even though Abraham had kicked him out. God knew where she was. God knows where you are. God knows what you're feeling. God knows... What you're, what you're going through emotionally and physically and financially. And he's got your back. For, you know, God loves us. He tells us so much that he'll never allow anything come into our life that's not good for us. For all things will work together for good to those that love the Lord and the called according to his purpose. Have faith in the days to come, but don't have faith in the world. Don't have faith in politics. Don't have faith in the, even a pastor or a Christian people. Put your faith in God. And then live together and minister together with the pastor and Christian people in your church and your family. But make sure that your faith, that you're holding on to, the God that we spoke about in so many ways here today. He loves you, and he cares for you. Now, if you're out there and you've never made that decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and decided to allow him to be Lord of your life, don't let another moment pass by until you talk to God through the Holy Spirit and ask him to come into your heart and save you and surrender your heart and life. To him. Father, as we come before you in prayer at the close of our service today, I give you glory, I give you praise, and I give you honor. And Lord, you are the great I am, Yahweh. You're the God of all creation. And Father, you are in control. And I thank you, Lord, for that. And I thank you, Lord, for the fact that you love your people so much that you work only for their good. Now help us, Lord, make the proper decisions of life in this world to give you glory and praise and honor that it might be well with our souls. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
God bless you folks, and we'll look forward to uh, sharing with you again after the new year. When it comes, please remember to let me know what you think about a drive-in service as we sort of start to get back to where we at least can view each other between cars before we get back to face-to-face -to -face service in the church. Uh, give me a call or email me, whatever way you can get a hold of me. Let me know. I need your input. All righty. God bless you. I'll see you next week. All righty, folks. Our children's message, children's story, will be coming up shortly. Stay tuned. taking a siesta there. You know, I'm taping this for you here on Christmas Day. I just had a big old ham, green beans, mashed potatoes, a big old feed, big old meal as Yvonne fed me. Oh, I got a little sleepy. Had to take myself a little nap there. But anyway, I'm glad to see you folks with me today. Uh, here on Christmas, uh, Kind of got to thinking about uh, our Lord, our God, Jesus, who came on Christmas time. And uh, my mind kind of went back to his, uh, the children of Israel. You probably heard of those, some people. Uh, they were the people that God chose, uh, Abraham, and made a nation out of him. And he dealt with them back in the Old Testament times. And, but I got thinking about them and, and their relationship with, uh, with God and what they did uh, to sort of visualize and, and stay uh, encouraged about who God is in their life. And, and they used to call him by various names. Now, God's given name is Yahweh, Yahweh. And Yahweh is the self-existent one. And he always was and he always will be. He said one place in the scripture there in the Bible, uh, he was the Alpha and the Omega. Well, Alpha is A and Omega is Z in the Greek language. And so he's the beginning, you know, he's the first of the alphabet and he's the end of the alphabet. So he's the self-existent. Well, that's his given name. But you know, the children of Israel, the, the Jewish people, they would always uh, call him by what he was doing for them and who he was in their life at any one given time. In other words, uh, if they were getting real worried about, you know, uh, the old devil in the world, how he was trying to take place and take over, or maybe one of those kings back there was giving them trouble, they would always remember that God was Lord over all. He was the boss of everything. And so instead of Yahweh, they, they'd be praying. They'd say, Adonai, Adonai, Lord over all. Uh, God is the Lord over all. And, and they'd pray about that. And it helped them to remember that God's in charge. He's in charge of everything. And sometimes, you know, maybe those children of Israel, uh, the, the people, the Jewish people, Maybe they'd get to where they were just worried about their income, you know, and how they were going to make ends meet, and whether or not they were going to have food or, or water or, or a bed to sleep in, and how, how are they going to get these things and what was going to go on. So they would remember that this God, that this Lord over all, that God was going to take care of them. And so they would call him Yahweh, which was his given name, Yahweh Rohai. And you know what that means? That means the Lord is my shepherd. I don't know, have you ever heard the 23rd Psalm? If you haven't, get mom and dad to read it to you. Tell them to look up in the book of Psalms, Psalm number 23, because it starts out, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the word that they would have used in the Jewish language would have been Yahweh, 
another Yahweh, Rohai. Yahweh Rohai is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so that would remind them of that. And then sometimes, you know, as you and I get kind of lonely sometimes and feel like there's, we're just all by ourselves, and maybe sometimes we think everybody's too busy to, to come play with us or to, to be around us or maybe read us stories. Or, and, you know, moms and dads kind of get busy sometimes because they have to take care of stuff, and God uses them, you know, to put food on the table and have jobs and clean the house and do stuff like that. So maybe sometimes we sit there and we think about, well, uh, how, how am I going to... Uh, you know, know that God loves me. Well, the Jewish people, the name they had for him then was Yahweh Shalom. And that means the Lord is peace. He would give me peace. He would give me comfort. And then if we worry about whether or not we're going to have what we need again, Sometimes it's Yahweh Jireh, the Lord who provides. And then, of course, we all kind of get sometimes where we're a little bit afraid. And we're just worried, you know, that something's going to overcome us. Or, you know, maybe we're afraid of the dark. Maybe we're afraid of getting on high places. Maybe we're afraid of getting up in front of people and talking. Well, then we can talk to God and call him, as the Jewish people did, Elohim. Because Elohim means God, his creator, powerful and mighty, Lord of lords. That's who our God is. He is over everybody, and he is the top banana. He's the head uh, for a rancher. He's the head foreman on the ranch. And then lastly, sometimes we think, you know, well, maybe I can do something that mom and dad told me not to do, and they're not around. Maybe they won't see me, you know. Maybe I can get away with it, you know. Mm. Well, that's not a good way to think. Because the Jewish people, when they think about, you know, getting by with something or being somewhere that couldn't nobody see what they were doing. Then they'd think about God's name, Eroi. Eroi. And what Eroi means is the strong one. That's what El means, strong one. Roi means sees, the strong one who sees. That's something you always want to keep in mind because I know you kids out there want to please Jesus and let him know that you love him and you wouldn't want to do anything that would make him sad. So you need to remember that God sees us all the time. Well, I hope that uh, learning about the different names and hearing about them of Jesus is giving you a little bit of comfort in your lives knowing that your God loves you and he sees you, he cares for you, he loves you above all things else and he's going to take care of you and can't know nothing or nobody come along and do anything that God doesn't see it and he's going to care for you, okay? Alrighty, let's pray together. Father, we give you glory and praise and honor. El Roi, God who sees all things. El Elyon, strongest strong one of the universe. Yahweh Jireh, he who provides for me. Thank you, Jesus. And that's the name we use for you most often, is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. And the Bible tells us that there's just something about that name. It has strength, it has power, and it shows us your love. Be with all these children. Let them know you love them. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, buckaroos. Remember this week, 
mind your mom and dad and do what they tell you to. I'll remind you that that's the first commandment with promise. And that's what the Bible tells us is your promise to live long in this world, to have a nice long life, if you will obey your mama and your daddy. God bless you, and God be with you, till we meet again.